All right, we're back to this one. We're reading a few verses tonight from Mark 10. Mark 10 and also Ephesians 4 and 11. So Mark 10, verses 42 through 45. Mark 10 says, But Jesus called them to him, and saith unto them, Know ye that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it be not among you. But whoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whoever of you shall be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Ephesians, we flip over to Ephesians 4, verse 11, starting, starting at 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting the ministry, the for the, for the work of the body of Christ, till we all come unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time to be gathered together in one place, in one spirit, in one name, that name of Jesus, Lord. Gather us together in fellowship and oneness of heart. Let your spirit be shed deeply in of us, and let it bring forth fruit. Let your word come forth, not my words, but your word. Let it speak to me first and to all those here, and those who hear your message. Speak to us, in Jesus' name, instruct us. Amen. You all may be seated. Last week I spoke just briefly on worship, our first purpose. and I had an idea to continue on that same path, to expound upon the second reason on why we're here, why we're on this earth, why we're floating on this spinning rock here in space. The second part would be to strengthen and encourage others, to lift others up. And that is not a simple task to think that and break that down. Because God calls us to be leaders. God loves us so much, he has given us and his people here to teach, to study, to direct each other. We too have become, are to become leaders in our household, leaders in our community. He has given us the opportunity to step up in ways you can't possibly imagine if you aren't listening and heeding his call. But we must make sure as we do this that our hearts and our minds and our soul are ready for what God has in store for us. So the purpose of a spiritual leader is soul care. So once your soul is ready, then you can step up in that form of leadership, that area of helping others and lifting others up. So what's the key question about soul leadership, about soul care for spiritual leadership? This question is from Jesus even we look at this in the context of what he said and what he demonstrated for soul care for spiritual leaders he said what profit a man if he had gained the whole world but lose his soul or what would a man give in exchange for his soul if we look at that in the context of leadership it changes all the way around what leadership is how leadership is defined by the world today the world today wants to give their soul in exchange for the world. They want to gain everything, monetary value, fame, fortune, recognition, popularity. They want leadership, but for the wrong reasons. They want leadership for what they think leadership brings. Ownership and all the carnal things that leadership brings. Jesus said it's not worth that because if you're choosing that, it's the wrong kind of leadership. Jesus talked about how a successful leadership looked. He demonstrated what successful leadership looked like. And he did so, even talking to, in the midst of the temple, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were there. Oh, they had achieved leadership in their time. They had a following. They had people who listened, who hung on their words for years, for different generations. But Jesus said, he gave them his examples. He said, listen to what they're doing. Understand it, but don't do what they do. He spake to the multitudes. In fact, let's turn over to Matthew 23 for a moment. Jesus had 
people that he was turning things upside down when it came to leadership. It was not what they expected to hear from him. Matthew 23, starting in verse 1, it says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All, therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works. For they say and do not. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be bore, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move one of their fingers. That doesn't sound like servant leadership to me. But all their works they do to be seen of men. And they make broad they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of the garments. They took on physical appearance to make themselves look larger, to make themselves look more important and pompous. They had the prayer shawls, they had all the garments etched and embroidered just the right way. They wanted to look the part. They might have looked the part on the outside, but the inside told the real story. Jesus was able to see them for what they were. He was able to look inside. He knew that they loved the uppermost rooms, as the scripture says, for the feast, and the chief seats in the synagogues. They liked the greetings in the marketplace. They liked to be called rabbi and master and teacher and leader. They loved the titles of the spiritual leadership that came with it. But woe unto them. He said, down to, jump down to verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for neither... For you neither go in yourselves, nor suffer you them that are entering to go in. What a warning. Woe unto you, you hypocrites. You devour widows' houses for pretense and make long prayers. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. He keeps saying it repeatedly. He wants it to get attention. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You come past sea and land, make a proselyte. But when he is made, you make him a twofold child for the hell of yourselves. They were seeking the riches of this world. They were seeking a position of authority. They wanted to be recognized. They did not have the type of soul condition that Jesus was talking about to be humble, to be a servant, to have the servant leadership mindset. Doing some research for my class on leadership training and team building, came across some interesting studies. Over a year ago, a common greeting and a common phrase that people would consider of someone who is aspiring to be a leader would upon a greet, greeting someone they would say how is it with your soul I thought that was interesting because the author of that study wasn't a Bible scholar he wasn't a Bible teacher he was studying history of greetings in aspiring leaders was the title of the document I was thinking how amazing that would be if we still greeted each other like that today how is it with your soul so what is the condition of your soul? In Psalms 103, it says, I bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Yes. If we're caring after our soul like that, if we're blessing the Lord with our very essence, with our very being throughout the day, as the different scriptures describe there in Psalm, how is the condition of our soul going to be? Is it going to be ready to help someone in need? Is it going to be ready to help someone who's hurting? Because if our soul is a mess, our whole life's going to be a mess. We may have the pretense on the outside. We polish it up looking real good, but not inside. We aren't going to fool God, and eventually people are going to see the real you. You can only hide it for so long. Eventually something, that light's going to get turned on, and people are going to see the real person inside. Something's going to happen at work. Something's going to happen at home, and you just have a meltdown or the wrong kind of breakthrough or break out, something's going to break out of you that you didn't want anyone else to see you had inside. And what condition are you to help lead at that point? We need to get our soul and our spirit and our heart in check if we're going to aspire to lead others and to build others and strengthen others for that second purpose of why we're here on earth. What would it look like to constantly lead from our souls? What place would this look like if we encountered God primarily with soul leaderships? with our hearts, with unbridled actions, and ready to be driven by God and not driven by our own thoughts, our own deeds, our own agendas. <clears throat> what would it be like to find a deeper connection with God in the context of spiritual leadership instead of our own agenda, instead of our own thoughts, instead of this world's plans, their ideas of leadership? 
this can be wrapped up with what we see in God. Because apart from Him, our soul is not doing well. There's different stages of becoming, having your soul prepared. If we look at one stage, we've got to be a seeker of God. We have to seek Him continually. We've been given some wonderful examples in Scripture of people who sought God. David was a man after God's own heart, and he's such an easy example. But let's go to Moses. I like going to Moses sometimes, because he sometimes is the most unlikely for certain things. God doesn't choose the perfect people. He doesn't choose the ones without any flaws to be used as his. But Moses, he knew how to be a seeker of God. If we look at the time when he thought he could run, God still sought him. He showed us through that different challenges of leadership that relying on God was the only way to become a seeker of God. When he was in the wilderness of the different congregations, he had to take time to seek God. He had a whole, he had the largest mumbling, complaining herd of people you've ever seen. He had to have some time away. He had to seek God for his direction, for advice, for wisdom. Exodus 16 and 2 tells us, And the whole congregation of, of children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. That wasn't just a couple people. That wasn't just a party of ten guys back there saying, Hey, it's hot out here. We're in the desert. Somebody make some changes. Turn on the AC. This is the whole congregation. There's estimates of that being in the millions. That's a lot of complainers. That's a small, that's a long line to get in. Let me take a number. He had to become a God seeker in order to get through that experience. We know it sometimes that took solitude. We'll get into that in a minute. And Jesus, he is our counselor. Isaiah 9 and 6 reminds us of the different titles. He is our counselor. He also is a warder of them who diligently seek him. Through different leaders who sought God, through different scriptures, our activities have to be coming part of that of seeking God. We get so easily distracted with cares and thoughts and concerns. Our schedule will fill up so fast if we allow it to. My wife knows all too well sometimes I have a hard time saying no. Especially when people come to me with computer problems or how do I fix that or check on this website for me or can you research this? Oh yeah, I like doing that. I, I like helping people out but sometimes I gotta learn to say no or I gotta learn to adjust my schedule properly because if I get too consumed, I don't have time to seek God like I need to. And if I don't have time to seek God for my needs and to strengthen my walk, how can I help someone else with their walk? How can I successfully pray for someone, encourage someone, give them a word from the Lord if I haven't taken time to seek that word myself, to get nourished and strengthened and encouraged? My soul has to be right. My soul has to be what I'm led by, which is in tune with God. So I need that time. I need that space. I need a space for change. Moses is awesome for signifying a space of change. He made a couple of mistakes there in Egypt when he was first growing up. He thought he could put some chain distance between his problems. He thought he'd have a space for change. Well, he got the space for change. He got a 40 years to think about what was going on. On his way out there, he had some time to think. Even he even interceded with some problems at the well, kicking things off. He had a heart for rescuing people in distress. We saw that in Egypt. We saw it at the well. He had a heart for caring for people. So God said, I'm going to take that. I'm going to build upon that. But first I need to get some time away. You need some time away from the things that you had been brought up in, the things you grew up in. Let's unwind and do some deprogramming. He was out tending the sheep, and he had to turn aside. He had to take some space from what he had going on and said, I'm going to see what's going on with this bush. I'm going to see why it's not consumed. His journey was successful. And his encounter with the, with the bush turned to be a, a life-changing event. He tried to come up with excuses at first, but he ended up being obedient. Our changes we go through to refine us, to shape us, to becoming a leader or aspiring leader, to be a mentor, sometimes that's a better word than a leader. We're going to go through profound changes 
we're going to be asked to do things that are out of our comfort zone, out of our realm of expertise. Because that's how God is going to shape us. That's how he's going to mold us to be what he wants us to be. To be used by him, we have to be out of our comfort zone. If we're in our comfort zone, we're still relying on us. If we're in an area we're used to, we think we're doing it on our own. We are not being used of God totally until we step out of that area and say, okay, God, I've never done this. I've never spoken this way. I've never had to reach to someone who has addictions, reach to someone who's hurting in this way. I've never tried to speak to someone about these type of issues. How do I pray about this, Lord? Well, good. I'm glad you asked. He would tell you. He wants you to be a little uncomfortable so he can show you the way, so he can fill in the gaps, so you're looking to him. But you need that space to do so. Solitude changed Moses, and it can change us. The same way it changed Elijah. He had just saw some great victories happen. But it took some solitude, it took some space for him to get some perspective, to get his focus back where it should be. He thought it was going to be in this great movement, but it was in the still small voice when he took that time away. He took that solitude, and then God helped him to be able to listen. He thought he had it figured out until God said, no. You're not the only one. He thought it was just him, but it wasn't. Sometimes we feel like when we're out to help others, when we're on this mission from God, that it's just us. We're the only ones. I'm the only one that can save these people. I'm the only one that can reach this town. We're not alone. We have to realize we're not alone. We have to look to others that God has put there to help us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to grow that body and nurture each other. But sometimes we have to take it, that instruction that comes in a space of time, a space of solitude. We've got to have a space for change. If we look up Matthew 14, Jesus gave us a great example of this even. Because he even, as a human... As being man, as fully man and full of God, he needed time and space to regain his strength and to focus on what he had going on. There's many examples of this in the scripture, but Matthew 14, 22 and 23. Straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get in the ship and go before him to the other side. And he sent the multitudes away. I'm sure they would have gladly stayed had, had he not sent them away. And when he sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. He took some time out. He took some time to pause. The Bible tells us all flesh will pray. And Jesus, as a man, needed that time to coop, recoup, to focus. And he did this to, to be an example to us. I believe he was an example to us in every way we needed fit. Every way we would encounter. He encountered temptation and faced it properly. He took time apart to show us how to take time apart. He spent time focusing on the things that needed to be focused on to show us how to do. He lived every way, lived every way by example. In Mark 1.35 it says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed in a solitary place where he prayed. He had a routine. Because the disciples said he would often pray, often depart to this place. Even Judas knew where he'd be because... He often went to that garden to pray. He took time. He had a pattern of being alone. Do we have a pattern in our lives of taking some time away, getting some quiet time with the Lord? I know sometimes it's hard. I can't imagine sometimes I know in my house it might be hard to find a quiet space with a, a little mouth that goes a lot. But we still love her. But you need to find a, quiet time, a quiet space to hear from God. Quiet away from your own thoughts even. Quiet away from electronic devices. They so easily steal our time and steal our attention. We need that space to be able to pay attention to what God has to tell us. Another way solitude enhances and enriches our leadership, it helps us seek a process to pay attention to God. Psalms 104 talks about the praises of God and seeing Him in the nature seeing him and the way he talks. It's like the, the lily of the valley, that's where the song that we sang earlier, how it describes God. Psalm 104 goes through many verses of how we see, see God in nature, whether it's 
the flowers, or the grass, or the trees. The only way you're going to see God in nature is if you take time to see it. You could be driving down the road. Nature could be all around you. But you're focused on that driver in front of you. You're thinking about, oh, what am I going to have for dinner? You know, oh, well, well who, I haven't returned that text message yet. Well, let me wait till I get there and answer that. A hundred thoughts will be going through your head. You don't see the beautiful trees out there. You don't see the, they could be changing color, a wonderful sunset happening. You could be missing it all. You might need to pull over and take a minute and take it in and see the God who created the universe, the God who formed this earth and put you in it. He needs that minute to talk to you, that minute to recoup and gain your composure and focus on him. Because once you start seeing him in one thing, you'll see him in another. It's going to be a domino effect. You're going to see him all around you. You're going to see him in incidents that you never expected, but you have to take the time to do it. You have to have that space of time to pay attention. It's going to affect your soul in a positive way. For a leader to take time and pay attention, it takes giving of yourself. If you expect to be able to care for someone later, you expect to be able to lift someone up, nurture someone, something as a Bible study, preparing meals for someone, anything where you're being used of God, you've got to learn to pay attention. You've got to learn to give of your time. If you can't do it in giving God some of your time to begin with, how are you going to wholeheartedly do it in the service of someone else later on? It takes practice. It takes routine. It takes dedication. It takes learning. But it takes commitment. Our commitment to God is about our relationship with Him. That's part of our soul care for spiritual leaders. It's essential that we craft time into our schedule because rushing around does not accomplish anything. Another serious part of soul care is handling stress. Hmm. I know about stress. <laughs> the Marine Corps made sure I knew how to handle some stress, and they, they enjoyed putting us in stressful situations to see how we'd respond. When I first started boot camp, we started with over 218 recruits. 97 graduated from my platoon. I would say not all of them could handle the stress of boot camp. It was only by the grace of God that I made it through. The stresses seen in certain environments, that pressure that's created, it can do amazing things, and it can do terrible things. It depends on the person. It depends on how they react. When you're preparing to lead someone, when you're preparing to help someone for spiritual matters, how you deal with stress is important. When we look at Moses, he had some unique stressful situations. He had issues with no water. He had issues with bad taste in water. He had people that didn't like the food. He had people that didn't like food from heaven. They, they could pick some interesting stuff to complain about. They wanted to go back to where there were whips because they fantasized about food that they probably didn't eat. They wanted the leeks and the melons and the the stuff that usually slaves didn't get in those type of environments. But they fantasized about it. But it took time. He was able to take time in that space from God and deal with that stress. If we look at Psalm 4 for just a moment. Psalm 4, starting with verse 3. It says, But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself, that the Lord will hear when I call to him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your heart upon your bed, and be still, Selah. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in thee. It's not as easy to be stressed when you're doing those things. When you set apart that time, and no, God, will hear your call. It's not easy to say, okay, I'm overly stressed. I'm going to let these problems take over my life. Oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to worry and fret. I'm going to stay up all hours of the night, pacing the floor. But I'm going to stand in awe and sin not. And I'm going to commune my heart with God. Wait, you can't quite do both at the same time. I've had some bouts of insomnia. I know about that. 
getting up and it's a good time for me to get up and pray. Good time for me to get up and read the word. I'm able to rest a whole lot easier after that. Put in your trust in the Lord. Lamentations 3, 24 and 25. The Lord is good to him that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good for a man to be both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. You have that space of time to handle stress when you pause and you wait on the Lord. Moses didn't always bother answering the people directly when they tried to stress him out. He knew how to go to God with his problems. Several times he went up on the mountain to speak to God. He said, Lord, you deal with him. He, but then he also interceded for him. How hard would it be to intercede for those who complain to your face? That is an example of leadership I can't even imagine attaining to at this point yet. I hope to achieve that one day, but I still have so much to work on. I want to be able to intercede for God for those that are complaining to my face about me. That's impressive. It's not easy. Moses, I can tell it frustrated him. I mean, we know he broke the tablets, the first set of tablets he got from God. That doesn't, that's just not someone who's mildly upset about something. God wrote those, then he broke them. God told him to speak to a rock. He smacked it. He had some stress going on. But he still sought God. Our leadership that we aspire to have that can transform us or can break us down depends on the space we have, how we take that space, and how we deal with stress. If we want to be able to train our soul to be ready to help someone else so we can accomplish what we're here for, we have to put some practices in place now. They have to become habits. They have to become routine and part of our daily life. We have to want what matters. And if you try to esteem a position of leadership for leadership's sake, you won't be happy with the results. You might get money. You might get fame. It's not worth it. All that money and that fame might keep you up at night. might stress you out. might ruin your life, ruin your family. Because that's not what really matters. And you'll find out way too fast after that happens. If you achieve the wrong kind of leadership, you achieve the wrong kind of goals, you're going to find out what really matters after you've lost it. When Moses was in the wilderness of the children of Israel, he wanted them to love God. He wanted them to serve God. He wanted to emulate how they should be. Moses knew God had a long-term plan and agenda for his people. We need to have one for our souls. What's the long-term agenda for your soul? Do you have a short-term plan? Your little five-year plan that you're doing something? I know what I want to achieve in this time. I know what benchmarks I want to set. If you have spiritual benchmarks you think you're achieving, you, didn't set, then you set the wrong ones. You need to let God set the benchmarks. Set the goals. Set his marks, his standards. Paul says, I'm pressing for the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. He didn't set the standards. Paul didn't. He didn't say, well, when I have this many number of followers, I know I've made it. I can sit back. I can retire. I got it good. He himself said he had to keep pressing. He had to keep striving. He didn't want himself to be a castaway after ministering to all those people. So it was a daily commitment he had. He had put this in practice and in place in his own life. He wanted to see others do the same. He had a focus on what matters. When we look at serving others, we have to look at the spiritual needs of others above our own because that's what really matters. Servant leadership, the first part, being a servant is what matters. That's the only way. Putting others first putting God's needs of their life above the other things of this world. Let's look at Matthew 20 for just a moment. Because wanting what matters for them, wanting what matters for your life, for your eternal soul, is, is the chief thing. Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28. 
but let it, sh but it shall not be among you. Whatsoever, whosoever will be the great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus was prepared to give that ultimate sacrifice. He gave it so we, as an example of what we need to do in servant leadership, of how we need to prepare to give everything. We have these missionaries we pray for. We put their picture up there. We may think about them once on Sunday, but are we thinking about them throughout the week? Are we seeing the sacrifice that they give? They're being an example of servant leadership. They have that desire of reaching forth for others. They want to see others lifted up and reached for. They're strengthening their fellow believers when they come here. They're encouraging us with stories of what God's doing in these countries. They have a passion and a fire for it. They have a space where they take time away from the things of the normal life, the normal routine, to hear from God. They want what matters. What are you doing to, for your soul? What are you doing for others? What are you doing to shape things in your life so you can be, have a soul that's responsive, a soul that's ready to help others and encourage others, help our lost friends, family, and loved ones to see God, to, to reach for God. We have different things that are going on in our church community we need to be there for, but we have to be ready in here. We have to be prepared. Philippians 2 and 4 through 7 says, Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Let this be in you, which was also, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took on the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. So as we stand tonight, it was just a quick word that the Lord gave me. I want us to think about as we prepare every day for our hearts to be shaped, our hearts to be molded, our souls to be prepared to be a servant. We have to go consciously every day into an effort. How can I help others? But how can I have my soul in tune with what God wants for me? How can my soul be put through the exercises and shaped and formed to how God wants me to be and prepared for his service? Because if I'm not tuned up, if I'm not shaped up, I'm not going to be able to keep up. So many people I see when I go to the gym who are, they have the routine down. They are dedicated to this far more than I ever have been. They, you can just tell by looking at them, they exercise daily. They put their body through an extreme regimen to look the way they do. Are our spirits that way? Can people tell when they're around us, when they talk to us, we put our hearts and our mind and our soul through that regimen. We have that daily commitment. We're working out in a spiritual way. We're working out in the Word. We're working out in prayer. We have a praise walk and a prayer walk both. Can they tell that from us? Can God tell that from us when he looks at us? That we have been in that spiritual gym. We've been working out that soul. Because that's the only way we're going to fulfill that second focus of being here for others. Being here to build the kingdom of God. Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, you've given us to hear just a little bit of a glimpse from your word about strengthening and encouraging us, Lord. Let us go every day walking in, in strength and encouragement that you can give us, that you build us up, Lord. Strengthen our hearts and soul of every person here, every person listening to this. Let them be encouraged by you. Let them not doubt. Let them not shirk back from any responsibility you give. It may not be comfortable. It may not be easy, but we know you are able to strengthen and encourage and guide and lead. With your power and your might, we can reach others. We can strengthen our church. We can strengthen our community. We can help encourage other believers, Lord. Give us the right word at the right time and let us to listen. Let us heed your word as we go forth. In Jesus' name we praise you, Lord. We lift up that holy name. Bless your name, O oh Lord. Thank you all for being here tonight. Go forth safely and keep everyone up in prayer. God bless.